cao rồi Got it Okay Yeah, okay And then for advancing, we should just use the keyboard Yeah Yep Space Yep Can I just so, me to just stand or um, yeah, and over there maybe. So, Brittany, thank you. Thank um, you. And I won't give a real formal introduction. The, those of us know you here, but why don't you just give a brief introduction to the people that are online? So, um, I'm, um, I'm Brittany Harlow. I'm a postdoc with the Forge Animal Production Research Unit here on campus. Um, I'm a trained animal scientist, but I also have some microbiological training as well with Dr. Michael Flythe as part of that unit. Um, and I am interviewing tomorrow for the um, scientist position, the open scientist position there. So if anyone's able to make, make it to the seminar, it is at 10 a.m. tomorrow, Cameron Williams. Um, today I'm gonna to tell you guys a little bit about some of the research that we're doing at our unit. Um, I'd like to first and foremost say that this is a unit project. This isn't just my project. The Forage Animal Production Research Unit, as you guys know, is comprised of uh, several scientists with several different areas of expertise, and we all work together on these projects. I'm just the lucky one to talk about it today. Um, this um, project, the last project I'll talk about in this talk, is also a collaboration with Berkman Nutrition and Dr. John Johns, so um, they were also part of this project. Um, so this, this talk is really all about clover, and we all, as a forage discussion group, know about clover and why it's important for our pastures. So this is not new information to anyone in this room. Yeah, this works. Okay. So we know that um, we include clover and in pasture to lower nitrogen inputs. Um, we worry about pasture quality, so it improves protein and digestibility of pasture. Um, it also improves forage diversity, and we know that all of those things help to improve animal performance. But there are other isoflava or other advantages of red clover in pastures, and what we like to focus on in our group are isoflavones. So red clover and other legumes are rich in isoflavones, and these isoflavones are a group of compounds in the flavonoid family. They can act in the body as antioxidants, and they're also phytoestrogens. Um, we've identified two new benefits of isoflavones, specifically in growth promotion and also vasodilation. So what happens to isoflavones after the rumen? Isoflavones are metabolized in the rumen by bacteria to make them more soluble or more um, agreeable to the rumen bacteria. They're then absorbed and they enter into the blood where they have antioxidant properties. They can act as anatomide promoters or like what um, we would observe as a runner's high, but they also decrease hypertension or a vasorelaxant. So why do we care about vasorelaxants? Well, we all, um, everyone in this room, I would guess, is familiar with fescue toxicosis. So we care about that because of fescue toxicosis. So fescue toxicosis is typically um, characterized by decreased prolactins, um, some winter coat retention or regrowth. So here's a picture by Jimmy Klotz of some animals. You can clearly see they're suffering from fescue toxicosis. Um, <laughs> amateur photograph. So vasoconstriction associated with fescue toxicosis actually impacts things like heat dissipation. So these animals are not as heat tolerant. They suffer a lot more from heat stress. It can influence nutrient absorption in the gastrointestinal tract, and it can have reproductive um, consequences, as we're all familiar with. But we could um, actually reverse these problems if we could get vasoconstriction reversed. So again, um, back to red clover. It has long been recognized that cattle in toxic tall fescue pastures um, perform better if there's clover in the pasture. And this has really been attributed to dilution of the pasture and that the animals have more um, options for forages to select, so they take in less alkaloid. However, what about vasorelaxation? We just talked about these isoflavones and how they can have vasorelaxant properties. Could that also be impacting animals doing better on fescue pastures? So when we study vasoconstriction in our laboratory, we use a Doppler ultrasound system to look at um, artery areas. So here you can see an image from a Doppler ultrasound, um, what would be considered vasoconstriction. 
versus vasorelaxation. So you can see pretty clearly here, um, the artery area is larger. The circle is larger on the screen. And then where is that in the body? Where, where did you do the, it's a Doppler image of what? I think it's the carotid artery. Okay. Yeah. So typically the alkaloids made by the fungal edified are in the toxic tall fescue are vasoconstrictors. So they look more like this when they're consuming toxic tall fescue. But we wanted to show the isoflavone metabolites in our vasorelaxants. And so they look more like this, which would be an animal consuming um, a non-toxic pasture. So the first animal experiment that was really done to look at this concept was performed by Aiken and colleagues and was published in Frontiers in Veterinary Science in 2016. In this study, um, they used six rumen fistulated goats. These animals were given Kentucky 31 seed or extracted alkaloids and then a red clover ac extract. Um, and then they measured again luminal areas of the carotid and the intraosseous arteries. So this is Michael's favorite graph, I believe. He includes it in all of his talks, so I'm sure everyone has seen it, but we're going to go through it again because it is a beautiful illustration of this dilation. So um, on this graph, you can see there's a, oh cool, there's a baseline. <laughs> this baseline would be like the average, so anything below it would be constriction, anything above it would be dilation. You can see when they start the fescue alkaloids, these animals are constricted. Then they added clover isoflavones, and they saw that these animals dilated. So again, these clover isoflavones were able to mitigate this vasoconstriction associated with these alkaloids. So when you're doing science, you always want to approach it from multiple angles to make sure it works in different circumstances. So this time, they started with fescue alkaloids and the clover isoflavones at the same time. You can see these animals are dilated. However, when they took the isoflavones out, they constricted. So again, illustration that these isoflavones can mitigate vasoconstriction. So again, clover isoflavones can mitigate vasoconstriction associated with fescue toxicosis. But what's important to note is again, this is a pen study. This is with um, extracted product isoflavone, which is very expensive. Um, not something that we're going to apply in cattle grazing systems, not something that we can utilize in the industry. So we have to look at other supplementation options. So then we moved on to a series of experiments looking at things like hay, pasture, and other legumes to be able to get these effects. And we also were interested in supplementation level, and I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go. So I don't have a large amount of time, so I can't go through every single study that we've done, but I am going to give you a little overview of all the studies along the way. So studies in between. So the first um, experiment was conducted in 2016 and 2017. And this was Glenn Aiken's experiment. And what he did and Tracy did is they interceded red clover and toxic tall fescue pastures. And they grazed steers either on those pastures or on just fescue pastures. And what they saw were that animals that consumed the red clover containing pastures had greater average daily gain in vasodilation than pasture only controls. So what, again, back to dilution versus dilation, is this simply because they were consuming less alkaloid because there was red clover in the pasture, or is there a dilation effect? So this was followed up by a study in 2018 and 2019 um, where we supplemented red clover hay with dried distillers grains or dried distillers grains only so to balance her protein or to get rid of that dilution type effect. Um, and what we saw again was that the one, the animals that consume red clover had greater average daily gain and also greater vasodilation. So when we get rid of the concept of dilution, um, we still get this dilation and this improved um, response with red clover. So through this time, um, Dr. Adam and Dr. Flight were giving a lot of talks to producers and talking to them about these um, projects that we were doing and a big question we got was can you use other legume sources and so this stimulated or shot off this experiment um, that we did looking at different um, isoflavone sources so red clover white clover or soybean meal in goats to see if we can mitigate vasoconstriction with seed and what we saw is that all of these animals or all of these supplementation strategies allowed for dilation. And the interesting thing about that, when you look at the data, is 
One, yes, other um, isoflavin sources can be used to be able to dilate these blood vessels, but also that these sources all varied in isoflavone concentration and also in um, composition. With white clover being, um, I can't give you an exact figure, but way less than what we would observe in red clover, but it still worked. So that indicated to us that we can actually use much lower levels of isoflavone um, to get this alleviation of vasoconstriction. So we wanted to look at different supplementation strategies again. And since we're so low in concentration, we moved on to a mineral additive. So we went from a 15% red clover supplement on a pasture to a very small amount added into a conventional boost mineral. So this is the main experiment that I want to talk to you guys about today. This is our most recent work um, in this area. And this experiment was done in collaboration with Berkman Nutrition. Dr. John Johns was involved in this experiment. And what we did is we took Holsteins that were rumen fistulated and we um, challenged them with edified infected 12 SQC. And then we gave them either 0%, 10%, 15%, or 20% weight to weight red clover. And then we looked at luminal areas of the caudal artery. So I think this is important to think about. Um, red clover is a feed. How does that impact consumption of the mineral? That was a big question to start. Can we put the red clover into the mineral and that the animals would still consume the amount of mineral that they needed to consume and not a bunch extra because it looks like feed? And if you can see here at 0%, 0%, it looks like conventional loose mineral, but by the time you get to 20%, we're really looking more like feed, right? So we might expect that these animals would consume a bunch of this mineral. And so we were trying to figure out, do we need to modify the mineral or add salt to try to decrease mineral intake or to keep them at that target intake? So we did a preliminary experiment with heifers out at the University of Kentucky farm that they let us um, utilize for this experiment, and we grazed two groups. Um, in duplicate, and we had a 0% red clover or just the conventional loose mineral intake treatment, and then we had a 20% weight to weight red clover mineral um, intake treatment. And what we found, as you can see here, is that they consumed about the same. So even though it looked like feed, they still consumed it at the recommendation um, levels. And the consumption was determined to be about four ounces, and that's um, approximately what the label recommends, and so we went ahead and utilized that amount for the experiment. So back to the experiment. So this is the basic experimental design that we did. Um, we started out with an adaptation for two weeks. Um, in this adaptation, they were um, adapted to their diet, and also they were kept in indoor pens for this experiment, so they had to get used to being inside and being confined. Um, during the adaptation, they were exposed to the red clover mineral that started there. It went all the way through the entire experiment. After the at the end of the adaptation period, we took um, vascular measures, and then we started our ergovaline challenge period, part one, which was one week, and we um, dosed it with 10 micrograms per kilogram of ergovaline um, in tall fescue seed. Unfortunately, during this time, as I'm gonna show you in the next graph, we saw that these animals were actually able to adapt in their vasoconstrictive effects of the seed. And so we decided in the second week of that challenge, which was originally supposed to be the same level, we stepped them up a little bit to try to get back into a constricted state. So we have our second week Virgo alien challenge where we stepped it up to 15 micrograms per kilogram, and then we observed them for the withdrawal period of one week. So, in result, 10 and 15% red clover mineral did not consistently mitigate vasoconstriction. We saw that it worked with some animals, didn't work with other animals, and it was um, partially effective in, at different time points. But 20% weight, weight red clover mineral always worked. So these are the results of the 20% weight to weight um, loose mineral. On the y-axis, we have our caudal artery area. Um, and on the x-axis, we have our sample day over time. The first point is our adaptation <coughs> point, and as you can see, I can't even show you, um, they're dilated at that point. If you follow along the black line, which would be the endified infected seed controls that did not get any red clover in their mineral, you can see that they actually constricted um, starting during that first period. 
and were able to adapt. So you can see by the time they got to the 15 microgram per kilogram period, um, they were back to almost baseline. Um, when we observed that, we increased um, the amount of fescue seed that they were consuming to try to get them back into constricted state so we could compare, and you can see that it did work. They were constricted again. Um, when we got to withdrawal period, they did recover so um, in one week. However, if you see and look at the 20% mineral treatment or the red line, you can see that that alleviation of constriction of, of what's observed in all periods. So the animals didn't really um, deviate much from baseline over the course of the experiment, indicating that the 20% weight to weight um, loose mineral was effective at mitigating this constriction. So future directions, obviously this is a pen study. This is, we dosed it transruminally. These animals were consuming mineral by choice. So we need to look at application of this in grazing systems. Specifically, does it work in the field? Will it work when they just have to choose to eat that mineral? Will it work um, when they're consuming grass as opposed to a fescue seed challenge? Does it work with different management? So every farm has their own way of managing their cattle. Um, they have supplementation strategies and things like that. We'll need to see how it works in different management situations. And then another big question that we get a lot is breeding stock. So 20% weight to weight in loose mineral is a very small amount of red clover, probably less than what they would consume in an average <coughs> pasture um, if cows were out on pasture. So I wouldn't expect there be, to be an impact on reproductive performance, um, but it is a phytoestrogen, so it needs to be evaluated. Um, also, as I said, every farm has its own way of doing things. Some people put out loose minerals, some people put out feed, some people feed once a day, some people feed every other day. And so supplementation strategies are, are a question. Are there other ways to supplement that might suit other producers that this might not work for? And with that, I'll take any questions. Very good. Okay. <laughs> We'll stop the recording so it wouldn't be shared and be easier just to do the presentation.